today we're going to continue our series on the one-hit wonders of the Bible. And by that I mean the books of the Bible that contain only one chapter. But that one chapter, that one-hit wonder as it is, was so good, it was so important, it was so full of significance that even that one single solitary chapter was given a title and was given a place within the 66 books of the Bible. So far, we looked at the one-chapter prophecy written by Obadiah. We looked at the one-chapter letter written by Paul to Philemon. And then last week, we looked at the one-chapter letter written by the Apostle John. Today, we come to another one-chapter letter written by John. Today, we're going to look at third John. Which makes me wonder, is it really a one-hit wonder, considering this is John's second edition of a one-hit wonder? So maybe it's a two-hit wonder for John. But see, John wrote three different letters. The second and the third letter are short. In fact, the one we're going to look at today, 3 John, is the shortest book in the Bible. Now you might be sitting there thinking, thank goodness, that means it's going to be a short sermon. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see how it goes. And as I mentioned last week, John wrote more than just these three letters. He also wrote one of the biographies of Jesus, and then he wrote the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. In fact, he is second only to the Apostle Paul in terms of the most material in the New Testament. So the question is, who is John? Now, there were a lot of people named John within the Bible. You can think of John the Baptist, but that's not who we're going to talk about. That's not who this John is. This is the first cousin of Jesus, also one of the 12 apostles. Now, he was even called the man that Jesus loved because he was Jesus' closest, most intimate friend while Jesus was here on earth. So much so that when Jesus was on the cross dying, he looked at John and asked John to take care of his mother. His three letters were written to tackle different problems within the church, either a false teaching that had taken root within the church or or a relational breakdown that had taken place within the community of the church. Today, our focus is on that third of John's letters. And as I did last week, I'm going to read it in its entirety, and then we'll kind of walk back through it. So here is the third book of John. This is a letter from John the Elder. I'm writing to Gaius, my dear friend, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I hope all is well with you, and that you are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. Some of the traveling teachers recently returned and made me very happy by telling me about your faithfulness and that you are living according to the truth. I could have no greater joy than to hear that my children are following the truth. Dear friend, you are being faithful to God when you care for the traveling teachers who pass through, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church here of your loving friendship. Please continue providing for such teachers in the manner that pleases God. For they are traveling for the Lord and they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So we ourselves should support them so that we can be their partners as they teach the truth. I wrote to the church about this, but Diotrephes who loves to be the leader, refuses to have anything to do with us. When I come, I will report some of the things he is doing and the evil accusations he is making against us. Not only does he refuse to welcome the traveling teachers, he also tells others not to help them. And when they do help, he puts them out of the church. Dear friend, don't let this bad example influence you. Follow only what is good. Remember that those who do good prove that they are God's children. And those who do evil prove that they do not know 
God. Everyone speaks highly of Demetrius, as does the truth itself. We ourselves can say the same for him. And you know we speak the truth. I have much more to, to say to you, but I don't want to write it in pen and ink. For I hope to see you soon, and then we will talk face to face. Peace be with you. Your friends here send you their greetings. Please give my personal greetings to each of our friends there. So there you have it, the third book of John. And often, you know, if your name is contained within the Bible, you know, you, you sometimes think about what that means. You know, I'm, my name is Matthew. It's one of the Gospels of, of Jesus, one of the biographies. But if your name is in the Bible, it can be good, a good thing, maybe. I mean, if you're Gaius or, or Demetrius, it's good to have that name. But, but man, it sucks if your name is Diotrephes. Forever remembered here as a rogue person as somebody who wasn't willing to welcome and to accept the traveling teachers. And there's a lot for us that, that, that we can get out of this letter. But the heart of this letter is clear. If John wrote his first two letters to deal with false teaching that was invading the church, then here he is sending a quick word to deal with some internal conflict. Specifically, a problem person within the church. But before we get into that, I want to talk for just a minute about how John begins this letter. Because in some circles, it has kind of taken on a life of its own and one that isn't good. Let me actually read it to you again. This is a letter from John the Elder. I'm writing to Gaius, my dear friend who I love in the truth. Dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. See, now, at first glance, you might think there's nothing much there to talk about. It's, it's a fairly generic greeting, using standard niceties of that day between two good friends. And it would kind of be like saying, hello, hope everything is good for you. Or, I hope... This finds you doing well. That's how we would probably translate it today. But, but you see, some people, some people have taken this to mean something more than just a standard nicety. They have, they've, they've taken it not as a greeting, but more as a declaration, more as a statement that if somehow, if you are sound in spirit, then you will be also healthy in your body. That if you're spiritually healthy, then you will be physically healthy. And not just physically healthy, but you will be materially well off. It's called the health and wealth gospel. You may have seen it on TV. There are several older TV generations that we, we know about and we remember. But it's also all over the internet. Now this isn't what John was saying. That's not the message here. He wasn't trying to say anything theologically here at all. He was just starting off a letter with a common greeting from that day. The same kind of greeting which was widely used in letters and correspondence during that time in history. See, he knew Gaius was doing well spiritually. He was just opened up by saying, I hope and I pray that you're feeling and doing as well as I know that you're doing in your relationship with Christ. Let me give a little teaching point here on how we should read and how we should interpret the Bible. You need to know how to read the Bible fairly on its own terms that you're, so that you're not misinterpreting what you're reading. And let me also say, I certainly hope that you all are reading the Bible. I want to encourage you to read it because you can't read it enough. There is always more that we should be reading and more that we can learn. Every time I read a Bible story, I get something additional that I had never really seen before. A couple little interpretive points that I hope will help you when it, when, when it comes to how you read the Bible. One of the most important principles is to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Let the Bible interpret itself. 
You see, if John was saying something as significant or something as provocative as a guarantee of health and wealth, then that would be all throughout the teaching of the Bible that it would, it would be something we would see over and over again, and it would be a clear principle taught throughout. But it, that isn't the case. So it should lead anyone reading this to be careful not to read too much into an opening greeting that we have here. God can certainly bring us material blessing. He can certainly heal us. But it's also true that some of the greatest saints in the Bible faced all kinds of persecution and poverty and difficulties. A second little principle for you, besides letting Scripture interpret Scripture, is to make sure that you never take a verse out of its context. And this is a good example here because John is writing to address an internal issue within the church dealing with a personality conflict within the church there's nothing in this letter about the problem of pain or evil or poverty or about how a walk with god would bring success or wealth see i could take verses out of context in the scripture and make it say almost anything i wanted it to say for example, let me, let me give you an example. I'm going to take three verses, just three verses in the Bible, and tell you something that you would never imagine you would hear probably from the stage of a church. Matthew 27, 5. Judas went out and hanged himself. Luke 10, 37. Jesus said, go and do likewise. John 13, 27. What you are about to do, do quickly. Not a message you would expect, but you can take any verse out of the Bible, take it out of context, pair, pair it with other verses, and you can have it say almost anything. So you, context is important. The context is clear. This third John is a personal letter opening with a common greeting of the day to, to segue into a particular issue that John is writing to Gaius about. So let's jump back in to 3 John. John was about to extend praise to Gaius because he had heard how he was doing what he was doing with those traveling teachers. And we talked a little bit about that last week in 2 John. See, if you remember, it was common in that day for Christian teachers and evangelists and pastors to travel from town to town, village to village, and encouraging and leading and ministering to the churches. They would be sent out for that task, often directly by one or more of the apostles. That was how the message of the Christian church and the Christian faith was expanding and, and taking place in that first century. It was, it was a traveling ministry. And it was common and, and even necessary for them to stay in the homes of believers. Because not every town had a Hampton Inn with a hot breakfast the next morning. It was, it was a part of their culture of the early Christian church in the name of love and hospitality to provide housing, to provide food to traveling teachers and pastors. And then during their stay, they would serve the church through their teaching. And then before they left to go to the next church, the church would provide them with resources that they needed to travel to that next church. It was, it was a good and a wonderful approach to spreading the gospel. But there were two ways that it could break down. The first is what we found that John had addressed last week in the second letter of John. It was when people would come to a town to seek to be officially received as, as a Christian... But given, and given room and board and given a platform on a stage to speak, but they weren't really authentic Christians. They weren't teaching what was true. They were spreading lies and, and false doctrines and teaching things that went against the very things that Jesus taught. Now, the other way that this could break down is what John is dealing with today in this letter. Not false teachers being met with resources and platforms, but good and godly men and women being met with a lack 
of resources and a lack of a platform. In other words, they, they were sent by apostles like John, but, but there was some rogue leader who refused to let them come to the church because they didn't want to be under anyone else's authority or they didn't want that church to hear anyone else's teaching. They wanted to be in charge. And John deals with it on two levels. First, on the macro level, reiterating the importance of serving traveling teachers in that day, investing in the mission of the church so that it could expand and grow. Here's how John put it. Dear friend, you are being faithful to God when you care for the traveling teachers who pass through, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church here of your loving friendship. Please continue pro providing for such teachers in a manner that pleases God. For they are traveling for the Lord and they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So we ourselves should support them so that they can be their partners as they teach the truth. See, John is very specific in his teaching and in his praise. Gaius and others within the church are serving these traveling teachers so that they, in the way that they should have. That was a good and a right and a strategic and an important thing for them to do. See, even if they were strangers, their generosity wasn't tied to the giving because they knew someone or, or because they were in on something or they were part of something. They gave out of a duty. They gave out of responsibility. It wasn't about them. It was all about the mission. And John makes two other things clear, that if Christians don't support Christian ministry, then who will? When Christians do support the mission, we're partnering with that mission. We're playing a part in that ministry when we support them. See, it's not just about writing a check or, or nowadays click, hitting a click and saying yes to give online. It's, it's become a part of what ministry is doing. See, when we partner with those ministries, we become traveling teachers and pastors and evangelists. We're working in orphanages, we're, we're housing the homeless, we're feeding the hungry. We're reaching people for Christ, we're baptizing them, we're seeing them grow. And I can look at the things we have done here as a church and how financially generous to the cause of Christ that we have been, and I can say with absolute conviction, look at what you have done as a church not what i have done it is what you have done through your financial support of this of the ministries of this church now i can't speak for every church but i can speak for this one what what your giving does here is amazing what what could you do with your resources that would be better than feeding the homeless in downtown Greens, greensboro every single friday what could you do with your resources that would be better than feeding the homeless in High Point the third Saturday of every month? What could be better than helping some of your fellow members when they've had medical bills that they couldn't pay? What could be better than paying for our children to attend a Christian school or even going on mission trips? See, more than anything, what could you do with your resources? That would be better than enabling what it takes to reach people who are far from God with the one single message that can alter their entire life. See, where they emerge from the waters of baptism, maybe with a fist in the air, a prayer of gratitude on their lips, and from that day on, their family is forever changed. Their marriage would be forever changed. The way that they would engage, the way that they impact the world is forever changed. And most importantly of all, their eternity is forever changed. I can't speak for every church, but that's what it means when you invest 
in what we are doing here at TAF. Now, you might know of something better to invest in that has a better ROI, I don't know, but that if, it, if it's me, I know what I'm going to invest in. It's the here, at this church, at the ministries of this church, that is where the greatest return on investment can be found. See, what, what John had to say to Gaius about the importance of serving the needs of the church and its mission. But, but then, John gets to the heart of what prompted this letter when he says this. I wrote to the church about this. But Diotrephes, who loves to be the leader, refuses to have anything to do with us. When I come, I will report some of the things he is doing and the evil accusations he is making against us. Not only does he refuse to welcome the traveling teachers, he also tells others not to help them. And when they do, he puts them out of the church. John tells Gaius that he has tried to write to the church about all of these things. He has tried sending traveling teachers to the church, but Diotrephes has stood in the way. Even worse, those who have tried to do the right thing, who've tried to help these teachers, have been put out of the church by, by Diotrephes. Now, we don't know all of the details. But we're told here by John that Diotrephes liked to be the one in charge, the one controlling things, the one who was always first. So instead of welcoming these traveling teachers, even the ones sent by the apostles, he rejected them. He set himself up as being in complete charge, being in complete control of the church and if if anyone challenged that he kicked them out of the church now I wish i could tell you that stories of leaders gone wrong in matters of power and control are rare but they're not most pastors most leaders are good people they're human they sin they need grace as much as anyone else but the vast majority aren't pathological. They're not predatory. But some are. They can wound a great many people through what can only be called a toxic spiritual abuse. They have no business being in leadership. And as long as they remain there, they'll have a trail of bodies behind them. Now you don't answer the call to ministry because you simply want to lead others. You answer the call to ministry so that you can serve others. And when that involves leadership, it's about being a servant leader, leading in a way that serves the church, not yourself, but here, with Diotrephes, you have a petty, insecure, power-hungry, control-oriented person who is threatened by John and any other leader who may come along. John was very clear with what was motivating all of this. Diotrephes wants to be first. It's all about personal ambition for him. See, in, in the Greek, that phrase that says, loves to be the leader is in the present tense. It literally reads, he is always loving to be the leader. Always loving to be first. And the result? Anything related to John, anything related to the apostles' teaching is being rejected. Letters being sent, emissaries being sent, anything, Diotrephes has to be the boss. He has to have things his way or the highway. And he won't submit to or acknowledge anyone else. But, but that wasn't all. Simultaneously with that, he was engaging in a smear campaign. 
calling people up, visiting with them in order to plant seeds of doubt, seeds of mistrust, of suspicion, or even outright accusations and slander against John. He wasn't just trying to build himself up, but trying to tear others down. And as false as the accusations were, there were some people who loved to hear about them, who loved to hear the gossip, and some even believed it. John makes it clear that, that he knows what's going on. And when he comes personally, he will address it head on. Now, I don't know about you, but I think I would hate to hear if one of the apostles of Jesus was coming to town to deal with me. It might be a little scary thought, and it, it, it actually reminds me of something that happened several years ago here at Taft. There were people who were making accusations against this church, and it made its way all the way to Charlotte, to the conference, and a meeting had to be called where the conference came and talked to us to see whether we were going rogue, were we following the path of Diotrephes. And they came and they talked to the, the leadership at that point, and they heard what we were doing, the ministry we were doing, the impact we were having. And at the end of that meeting, the conference said what we heard was wrong continue the ministry that you have started. You see, people will try to tear a church down. They will try to stop a ministry that's going on, the, the, the impact we can have in the community. But it's a good thing for John to step in here. See, too many leaders fail to confront things that happen like this, situations like this, people like this. Even organizations themselves can often turn a blind eye. So good for John. Good that he stepped up and he was saying something about it, that he was confronting the issue. And the way that John phrases this is interesting. He says he will bring it out into the light. He will make it known to others. He will let people see it for what it is. Which tells us that Diotrephes was hiding his bad behavior behind a, a kind of a veneer of spirituality. He had some people seeing him as a good guy, as the one trying to protect the church from people like John and from teachers that John was sending. See, that, that was his only voice, his teaching, his leadership. He says that that was the only good, sound, and godly message that anyone really needed to hear. See, leaders like this really can get toxic and create a toxic culture, almost brainwashing those around them and then cutting off and throwing out anyone who doesn't follow them. So Diotrephes himself was probably so self-deceived, so cut off from Christ, that he, he may not have even been in touch with what his agenda was. See, that's true of a lot of people who become problems. They're so incredibly self-deceived that they don't see that they're the problem. They think they're trying to fix things. So that they're given, in a, they're given to, into a particular attitude like pride or greed or control because they've given into what they don't see. It's, it's their self-deception. They really can think that they are the spiritual ones. Diotrephes probably thought that John was the bad guy. That, that it's because he had quenched that's because he had quenched the work of the Holy Spirit in his own life. He had ignored conviction. He had given in to rebellion and, and against authority. He had given in to pride. So while he's talking a spiritual line, that's not what's motivating him at all. He just wanted to control things, to be in charge. 
Which is why John reminds Gaius about how to read people like this. And it's, and it's a straightforward litmus test. Here's what John says. Dear friend, don't let this bad example influence you. Follow only what is good. Remember that those who do good prove that they are God's children. And those who do evil prove that they do not know God. John's litmus test, judge them by their fruit. If they do good, if it's a reflection that they really are one of God's children, but if they do evil, it shows that they don't know the Father. And by doing good, it's not just about doing good things or being successful or having a lot of results. It's not about numbers. See, on the surface, Diotrephes may have looked like the best Christian leader. Maybe he was the greatest speaker on the planet. But John was making it clear that it's what's beneath the surface, what's behind the numbers, behind the success that truly matters. The fruit to look for is the fruit of the Spirit. Is there love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and humility? And there, in those terms, Diotrephes was far from God. He was arrogant. He was prideful. He was egocentric. He was conniving. He was lying. He was deceitful. He was petty. He was slanderous. And John had a different picture of character, a different picture of leadership, one that came from spending three years with Jesus himself, who said, I came not to be served, but to serve. A man who on the night before his death got up, took a bowl and a towel, and went from man to man including John himself, and washed their feet. See, that was the character, that was the model John had of leadership. See, then John ends by saying that he sent another traveling teacher their way, a man by the name of Demetrius, who was bearing this very letter that John had written. And he reminds Gaius to continue to do the right thing by such men that are sent by those traveling ministers. He reminds them to, to take them in, to house them, to feed them, to let them in turn serve and to feed you. And then to provide what they need as they continue to the next church. Your simple message. Take care of them. And a lot of packed into this letter. We talked about how to interpret the Bible fairly on its own terms. We, we learned about how the importance of being a financial contributor to the church. Third John also pointed us towards issues related to pride and to arrogance, to judge people based on, the, on their basis of their character. So I, I appreciate this being in the Bible because it's just that real. And here was this guy who had to be confronted. And it wasn't pretty, and it probably wasn't very fun either. But we're still drawing from it today. It's how God can interact with that and redeem in any situation. Next week, we're going to close out this series on One Hit Wonders with a look at, at the last of the five one-chapter books in the Bible. And I'll go ahead and give you a little bit of a preview. If you've been a Christian for any length of time and you've never heard anyone preach from the book of Jude, it's probably a reason. A little teaser for next week. Heavenly Father, there is none like you. Our God is greater, he is stronger, he is higher, and he is a healer. If God is for us, then who could ever stop us? Because there is none like you. Jesus.